I want to just note, uh, just like really appreciate the um, uh, Katie Trazo's uh, presentation right before this one because it really highlighted a lot of themes that have sort of come up in in my research and also I think are really pointing a way forward for how I think the sort of interface between uh, permaculture and uh, and agroecology and agroforestry, just the way that we should be thinking about that relationship. And so that was, that was great and, and set me up really nicely. So thanks. Um, so uh, I've been working with Dr. Sarah Lovell at University of Illinois uh, for the past five years uh, on this, um, on several projects, uh, trying to develop some of the kind of baseline research on permaculture, because uh, there really hasn't, hasn't been any and uh, just defended about a month ago. And so this is actually my first experiment with putting doctor in front of my name. And it really feels uh, 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 see, Thank you. Um, but it feels really weird. <laughs> so I just thought I would share that with you. So uh, there's been, I think in many cases, like a lot of name recognition around permaculture. And not necess that doesn't necessarily indicate that people have a good idea of what that is, uh, is actually referring to or, or pointing to. And so we'll just uh, talk about that just a little bit. Um, it's a, an approach to the design of human settlement uh, that was founded in the late 70s by a couple of Australians. And while its scope has broadened considerably in the decades that followed, at its origin, it was specifically focused on um, perennial production systems with animals integrated. And uh, it was also coming, uh, it was also emerging pretty much at the same time that agroforestry as a framework was being sort of developed and promoted. And so there's a sort of interesting parallel history there to trace between agroecology, agroforestry, and permaculture. Uh, at this point, despite the lack of any significant institutional support or scientific backing, it's very broadly distributed internationally. Um, and this is a uh, this is a sort of kind of Facebook for permaculturists uh, that I don't think is actually getting that much use after people register for it. <laughs> but it is an interesting sort of snapshot of um, uh, one snapshot of the sort of global distribution of people identifying with permaculture who have internet access. Um, and this uh, also I conducted a, a web survey in 2012 that was open to anyone who identified with permaculture in any way regardless of geographic location, but was only available in English. So it's a very sort of partial and skewed, um, both by the English uh, language constraint and by the fact that it was on the web. Um, so we see, even with those constraints, a pretty uh, broad geographic distribution. And the paper based on this survey is in revision for ecology and society. So hopefully it will be out before too long. And the content of that international network is uh, especially as it's sort of expanded since the uh, initial sort of strict kind of production focus, perennial animal integration focus, is on this expansive sense of kind of the ecological design of, uh, of managed landscapes. Conscious design and maintenance of agri agriculturally productive ecosystems, although not necessarily uh, only production, but kind of integrating production into, into other kinds of spaces. So moving towards multifunctional landscapes, which have the uh, diversity, stability, and resilience of natural ecosystems. And it's, uh, and th oh, these are sort of two kind of um, classic activities you might find within sort of representative of what happens in the permaculture movement of um, a small diversified farming system uh, incorporating annual and perennial production worked partially by hand labor and and then also a workshop on the design of perennial polycultures. And the, um, you know, sort of part of my intention with this research is sort of to, to try and intervene into the, the sort of polarized debate between permaculture's sort of most vociferous detractors. Um, I believe the kids today call them haters. Uh, who say that permaculture is really just a pyramid scheme and all that attending workshops like this uh, for free to do is teach workshops like this, right? Yeah. And, uh, and with that one being one side of the, 
of the, well, not, it doesn't qualify as a debate, actually, but of the conflict. And on the other side are sort of permaculture's most starry-eyed evangelists who say, well, you know, with, with permaculture, um, with, these, with these conceptual tools and these approaches and these practices, um, farmers or anyone can manage really complex, diversified production systems, uh, which heavily emphasize perennials and uh, create a, an extremely labor-efficient, productive, multifunctional system. And it's going to be awesome, and we can all do it right now. And I think that there's, uh, I think that both of those, um, while I understand the sort of the, I guess the, the motivations or the reasoning behind both of those positions, I don't think either of them actually serve us very well for understanding what is a value in permaculture and how we can make use of it best and how we can, um, how we can improve upon the, uh, whatever weaknesses we find there. So I approach permaculture uh, uh, in many ways through its sort of relationship or parallels with, with agroecology. Um, and this is uh, kind of drawing on the, the review paper that's, that's cited here. Uh, and I, for, for the purposes of uh, this presentation, focusing on its the sort of distinctive characteristics of uh, this to sort of design framework, which there's like a, a real lack of tools and attention to design process and to spatial configuration uh, in, in a lot of the sort of decision support materials that are available, certainly in agroecology, although it's, it's, a, it's somewhat in agroforestry. And also the, um, the really sort of distinctive, distinctively sort of aggressive emphasis on perennial polycultures and the potential of uh, perennial polycultures. So for my field research um, and this slice of the analysis of field research, I'm looking to quantify the nature and scope of income diversification across permaculture farms, uh, both looking at um, how much they're able to actually generate income from perennial systems, how uh, broadly their income is distributed across uh, perennial, and non, and, uh, perennial and other kinds of production, as well as non-production enterprises, and uh, quantify the degree to which actual agroforestry practices are being adopted, or is it you know, the sort of one hypothesis is that the literature on permaculture is sort of all talk and no one's, and everyone's just doing annual vegetables. Um, and, and then looking at that and looking at the sort of both kind of uh, statistical and qualitative analysis of, perma of what I find on permaculture farms to say, okay, what's the role that's being played here in, for, 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 of permaculture in both uh, catalyzing adoption and then once systems are adopted, actually supporting farmers and managing those systems. So my field research for, uh, for this project involved uh, initially identifying 165 potential, uh, potential permaculture farm sites through a whole variety of methods, uh, most of which were web-based, and then uh, getting 100 and 10 of those to respond to a very short preliminary survey just to assess uh, the, the scale of production and the degree to which they're actually influenced by permaculture as opposed to permaculture being sort of one buzzword in their sort of market of uh, basket of branding terms. And, um, and then identifying priority sites from that, from that pool of far farms that are interested in future research and crowdfunding to, uh, to visit 48 of those sites in 2013 and 2014. So these were, these were my Google Maps driving directions for that period. Um, and that was an amazing adventure that I am grateful I don't have to do again anytime soon. <laughs> it was uh, uh, 18,000 miles of driving. And so I'll talk here about sort of just characterization of just what's happening on permaculture farms. When I started this project, I didn't actually think that there were permaculture-identified farms in North America. I thought, okay, we've made a lot of headway in education and gardens, but I, uh, I thought I would have to work really hard to find four or five case studies to go deep on in terms of people who are really using it in a production orientation. And so the sort of the low-hanging fruit, if we can go after one well, the remaining low hanging fruit is just to characterize what's happening on these farms. What do they look like? What's going on? Um, uh, Agroecosystem mapping 
and then classification and clustering of the firms based on this question of how is their income distributed across different kinds of production and non-production enterprises. And there was also a, a, uh, a part of that analysis that I won't be really getting into today, which is sort of modeling different drivers on sort of labor efficiency and returns to labor. So for the characterization piece, um, the, uh, and on the, um, the statistical analysis is based on a subset of 36 of these farms um, that, uh, where the, the data set was of high enough quality and complete enough to, um, to, to do modeling on. And so the, the sort of like first look at, um, at sort of any of the parameters of what I found on these farms is just an extremely high level of diversity a very broad range and the, uh, the, a question that was asked of me as I, um, as I was completing that research were mm -hmm. people again, and again, of course, it's a very reasonable question, we're like, oh, what were the patterns that you saw? And this was like, you know, huge diversity, like a very wide range of uh, styles of production and scale. So starting with scale, we've got, you know, between $2,000 and $800,000 in gross income, between 1.5 and 1,500 acres in production. Uh, and so, you know, many of these farms, you know, depending on the sort of regional context, some folks would say, well, those aren't farms, you know, those are, those are, those are hobby farms or those are weekender farms or that's just a, a market garden. Um, but what the, the criterion I applied was, are these people identifying what they're doing as farming and then not assuming anything a priori about what that would actually mean. And we see a, a similar range, as you might expect, based on the range and scale in terms of age and experience from farmers who've been farming for between two and 40 years and uh, farm ages between absolutely brand new and a century old. And the, the older farm raises an interesting question because it clearly was not um, designed using the tools of permaculture uh, because it was designed 100 years ago. And so that farm in particular sort of sheds light on some of the proposals that permaculture is making, but not necessarily on the sort of design system itself. And we'll have like a little tour of uh, a few of the farms, the, the process of uh, agroecosystem mapping and land use and land cover classification is ongoing. So we'll look at a few uh, examples of, of uh, what we found out there. And this sort of preliminary classification of land cover and land use um, is just based on this range from sort of constant disturbance, uh, annual production, up through uh, sort of permanent forest. And I, I distinguish between woody perennial land cover and forest just based on, to have a distinction between sort of orchard and, and, and forest. So this is a, this is a site in Oregon. Um, and I've, this is one I visited in January. Well, um, that uh, so it's not it's not especially lush. But this the kind of the primary economic engine at this farm was um, uh, was seed production, and so they have this sort of um, extensive extensive organic seed production operation as well as networking with other um, with other seed producers. And but in their seed production, they um, they had integrated sort of annual beds. Um, either on a sort of block by block or row by row with, uh, with perennial vegetation, um, generally cropping species, but some just sort of hedgerows. And also doing uh, grazing, sheep and goat grazing in both open and sort of um, full canopy pasture. And this is a, a site in Tennessee that actually was, um, oh, and the, sorry, the preceding site is Seven Seeds Farm in Oregon. This is a spiral ridge in Tennessee. And this, uh, this operation was started on a, a, um, a patch of land that was not only clear cut, but the, uh, the, the, the footprint of this farm is on the area that was the staging ground for the, for the clear cut. So it was just basically a moonscape when they got there. And now as it regenerates naturally, they're doing rotational multi-species silvopasture sort of through across the regenerating slope in order to try and steer the, the direction of that regeneration and planting um, chestnuts and some 
uh, bamboo cultivars sort of in patches along that slope. They are uh, making use of um, earthworks for managing the flow of water across the landscape. Um, this is a, what in permaculture is called a swale, um, but in other disciplines it's called a contour ditch or a bund or a Burman basin. And so they have this large swale across the slope and then are also using it as a, uh, planting a linear sort of forest garden along the berm uh, as they do and integrating some small livestock production with sort of diverse perennial polycultures. Here's an, uh, this is a farm, um, uh, Manzanita Ridge in central California in an area of pretty extreme uh, drought and which was already you know, very advanced when I was there in 2013. And uh, they have a multiple water management structures. They're really uh, harnessing the slope that they have, uh, the extreme slope, uh, or the steep slopes rather, that they have on that property in order to uh, move water around into, um, uh, into the, its most basic useful locations for storage so they can irrigate by gravity to um, as many of their planting areas as possible and doing a fair amount of, uh, of topography modification in order to create more planting zones and control the movement of water. And as well, they have a sort of non-production enterprise of providing pollination surfaces for uh, local producers. Thanks. This is a Radical Roots Farm from um, Virginia. And they're doing... Uh, some of these farms had like this sort of classic uh, like market garden annual production, sort of small organic production. And they're also doing um, what I think is a, a really sort of standout example of integrating some of the Elliott Coleman style organic market production with uh, a whole variety of, um, of sort of perennial features and water control structures where they have um, these contour beds that are raised beds, so they're acting, uh, they're acting as sort of water breaks at the same time, and alternating rows of, of, uh, of perennial features above and below the annuals, as well as sort of the classic market gardening strategies of low tunnels and drip irrigation. And this is the 100-year-old farm, uh, Chaffin Orchards in Oroville, California. Um, and they've got the, the actually oldest olive planting in California. And they do, mul they push uh, sort of multi-species grazing through their 1,500 acres of, of olive grove. It's actually, it's mostly olive grove and a few blocks of citrus and stone fruit, as well as having rangeland and a, uh, and a massive reservoir that's uh, up on this tabletop mountain, this mesa that's they're backed right up against. So a lot of sort of integrated ecological and perennial production strategies. And so if we zoom out from the, uh, from the 36 farms in the sample to all 48 sites and just look at um, who, who are implementing agroforestry practices and what number, including uh, ones that aren't necessarily being used for commercial use, we see uh, a sort of level of implementation that's um, maybe not as high as we might expect if we only listen to sort of uh, permaculture's sort of starry-eyed evangelists but is much, much higher than the sort of background level of adoption on any other small and diversified farms that I've seen. So a lot of um, NTFPs, including, uh, not including silvopasture, of which there's, there's also a fair amount, woody polycultures, as well as woody um, and uh, annual and herbaceous perennial polycultures. So pretty, pretty high, encouragingly high levels of adoption. And with the uh, clustering based on the uh, distribution of income across multiple enterprise classes, um, cultural here refers to uh, services like education and design. And material services refers to value adding as well as some, anything like machinery repair or landscaping. And then we've got three different sorts of production as well as a sort of leftovers category for everything else. And if we just listen to, um, so if we, if we just listen to permaculture's sort of uh, public relations about itself, we'd be like, oh, well, we'll sort of expect all the farms to be in this category. And if we just listened to the, um, 
its harshest critics, we would probably expect them all to be in this category, where there's, no, there's not really any significant income that's coming from production. But in fact, we see um, the, the firms were fairly evenly distributed across these categories. And some of the farms appear to be doing just what sort of permaculture is sort of saying, this is what we all need to be doing in terms of agriculture. And um, for, the, for the others that are uh, uh, incorporating a fair amount of non-production enterprises, in this way, permaculture is just, uh, these permaculture farms are just showing that they're much like um, the rest of the population of diversified farming systems, certainly throughout the industrialized world, the vast majority of which are incorporating a lot of non-production income in order to maintain, um, in order to maintain their, the, their sort of agrarian livelihoods. And so, just wrapping up, permaculture farmers are implementing, implementing agroforestry systems at a high rate. They are managing highly multifunctional and diverse landscapes. They're also facing the same hostile um, pl uh, policy and market forces, the same hostile environment that other agroforestry producers and diversified farmers are. Um, they're using a set of strategies that are very familiar uh, to, uh, to anyone who's familiar with sort of pluriactivity and livelihood diversity on uh, small farms uh, throughout the industrialized world. And permaculture is kind of not, neither a magic wand nor a total scam, right? Um, it's not enabling farmers to just simply overwhelm or ignore the constraints uh, that, that market and, and policy are putting on them, uh, which is not, it's not actually a, a criticism. <laughs> I would, it would be unfair to expect that. It is fostering the, the narratives and the values that, um, that actually inspire and mobilize farmers to maintain diversified production and agroforestry production in the, in, in the face of a hostile environment, rather than getting out or doing something simpler or leaving farming entirely, and are motivating the sort of renaissance of new farmers to develop uh, diversified and perennial systems. It's also providing some social capital uh, for farmers who uh, integrate education enterprises uh, in, order to, in, in their, their livelihood profile in order to maintain the sort of agrarian base and farm-based livelihood. And it's also, as Katie so well noted, it's connecting farmers with communities and networks that can be sources of support as well as sort of a customer base. So thank you very much, and thank you to my advisor and funders. There's a question over here and then over there. Yeah, I might have missed it, but you mentioned that you spoke with people who self-identified with permaculture. Did you say how many of those people also, if any, self-identified with agroforestry practices? Um, I didn't ask that as a, as a specific question. Oh, sorry. Uh, the question was whether uh, how many of the farmers self-identified uh, with agroforestry or as agroforesters, and I, I didn't ask that question. That would have been that would have been interesting to ask. But you did it through observation, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks, Rector. I've got. I really think your presentation and your work is pretty, is very interesting and, and very relevant. Uh, two questions. One is pretty straightforward, and that is in the cluster analysis of the farms. Do you have any idea of how many farms were in each of those groups? I didn't see a number there. Yeah, I'm sorry I didn't put, uh, put the N for each group, but they were, um, it was the sample of 36 farms was fairly evenly divided, so it was five to seven Great. in each group. Um, and then my second question, and maybe this is more for the discussion this afternoon, but do, do you think that your research really suggests any ways to break the mutual animosity between academy and, the, the academy and academic pursuits and per permacultural movement? goes back to this history over the last 30 years. Yeah, I mean, the permaculture uh, has one old permaculturist who had, didn't identify with permaculture anymore said to me, permaculture has taken a heavy shelling. Um, and I think that's, in some ways, those criticisms are legitimate. Um, I do very much hope that, uh, the, that th this research can contribute to um, rebuilding some of those bridges or just building them in the first place, because um, they yeah, they were, you know, Mollison and Holmgren really burnt them 
as thoroughly as they could around 1980, right? And they haven't really been rebuilt since then. But I also feel like I've been, I felt very well supported by my department, you know, and I'm at University of Illinois. It's not, um, <laughs> you know, in terms of agricultural research, it's, it's not a backwoods hippie college. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and I've had good responses to the papers so far. So I feel like it's actually the, everybody's kind of, I think, is really showing up to kind of mend that thing, and they're just waiting for the, the right context to do so. Yeah. Uh, who's who's success, though? The, because some of them they have very different goals. Oh sure. Um, the uh, uh, what are the having seen so many farms? What are the salient features of successful permaculture farms? And these farmers. Uh, the very different kinds of farm structure and sort of enterprise profiles that we see reflect very different goals that the farmers have. Um, and, and so there's, um, I think most of, most of the, uh, the farmers that I talked with were pretty psyched about their lives. And so if we can sort of like boil success down to sort of a fundamental principle, um, I, I don't have a statistic for you on that, but they, um, most of them were, and I got some feedback actually early on as I was divining, designing my methods from um, a permaculture farmer who was later in the sample. He said, you, you are like, I forbid you to analyze uh, permaculture farms based solely on profitability because many of us are doing this knowing that we will make less money and enjoy our lives more. So, so it's, a, it's a complex question. I didn't, I didn't specifically uh, ask that question, though. No. I, there was, it was a full, I was designing to, to visit this many sites. I was designing my methods that I could do them in an afternoon if we were really focused. And so there's a lot of questions that I'm curious about that did not uh, get asked. We talk a lot uh, at this conference and before about peer to peer, uh, farmer to farmer being the transmission strategy for agroforestry adoption. Mm -hmm. um, in, in visiting these permaculture farms, uh, did you see, what, what kind of relationships did you see between the farmers and their, the, the neighboring uh, producers? Probably didn't I would, a chance to look at it, but. Yeah, I, did, I didn't, so I wasn't collecting data on that specifically. Um, the, uh, actually, well, for, 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 some, for a subset of the farms, I have some information on like their rating on how, um, how acceptable their connection is with other producers, but I haven't been able to, I haven't been able to analyze that piece yet. But um, yeah, I don't have actually a strong impression because it wasn't a big focus. One, one more. Yeah. One more announcement before lunch. I was given uh, the 106th annual meeting for the Northern Nut Growers Association. It's going to be held in La Crosse, Wisconsin, um, July 26th through 29th. And it looks like their contact information on here is www.thenorthernnutgrowers.org. So I'm sure you can find all the information you need there or come check out this flyer. Um, I guess now we'll break for lunch and let's give Raptor one more hand. Right.